I apologize for some of my interruptions. I uh, discovered some details that haven't been done, so I was trying to take care of some things. But uh, I'm going to talk to you this morning for a little bit before communion about a word that we use in our everyday language but tends to have a different meaning in Christian circles or biblical language. Uh, uh, Old Testament lesson is from the book of Hosea, chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, and then we'll have a New Testament lesson. Then the Lord said to me, speaking of Hosea, Go again and love a woman who is loved by her husband, yet who is an adulteress, even as the Lord loves the sons of Israel, so they turn to other gods and love raisin cakes. So I brought her for myself, for bought her for myself, for fifteen shekels of silver, and a homer and a half of barley. And then I said to her, You shall stay with me for many days. You shall not play the harlot, nor shall you have a man. So I will also be toward you. For the sons of Israel will remain for many days without a king or a prince, without sacrifice or sacred pillar, and without ephod or household idols. And afterward, the sons of Israel will return and seek the Lord their God and David their king, and they will come trembling to the Lord and to his goodness in the last days. And in the book of Romans, Romans 3, 21 through 25, uh, 20, 21 through 26. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For all those who believe, for there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. There, this was to demonstrate his righteousness, because in the forbearance of God he passed over the sins previously committed. And for the demonstration I say of his righteousness at the present time, so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Just and justifier. As we prepare our hearts for communion, and as we've just come through the Easter season, Resurrection Sunday, which we talked about his resurrection on Easter Sunday morning, and then our resurrection, the fact that we will rise when Jesus comes back again. Uh, this morning, I would like us to think about the fact that this is all part of God's plan for salvation. We needed to be redeemed from our sins, from our sins in general, from all our unrighteousness, from maybe particular sins, maybe we were slaves to pornography or drug addiction or alcohol or just being workaholics or just being people that denied God that were living our own way. But we were all in general slaves to sin. God took it on himself, his plan of salvation, which included the work of Jesus Christ, to redeem us from the pit, so to speak the pit of slavery to sin. I've shared with you before when this word has been mentioned, uh, my earliest recollection of redemption, long before I knew what it meant biblically or in Christian terms, was redemption centers and s &H green stamps. That's my earliest recollection. What, not too sophisticated, not too spiritual. But that's what I first thought of as a child or a young young person. Today's world, I don't know that stamps are still redeemed. I, I haven't redeemed any in a long time. But the secular definition of redemption 
is to regain possession in exchange for a payment. And it's a payment we make. You know, in today's vein, we can think of uh, coupons at restaurants, our grocery stores that we redeem to get a discount or to get something free. Some folks, it's a regular activity, and uh, we know that pawnbrokers let you redeem your merchandise if you pay them, usually a hefty uh, dividend or interest price for what you did. In fact, I remember a number of years ago, maybe seven, eight years ago, early on in my ministry here, we had a break-in and we had things stolen out of the church and the people were actually caught because they were on camera at a lo local pawnbroker and we caught them trying to pawn our merchandise, our, our belongings. And so they were caught and I don't know what happened to them after that. We didn't see them very often. But pawnbrokers redeem things and you go to redeem your merchandise. Uh, lottery tickets, now, I don't, buy lottery tickets, but I know a lot of people do, and I'm not passing judgment, but they call it redeeming your ticket. If you have a winning lottery ticket, you go and redeem your ticket to claim your prize. And there's all sorts of other things that we redeem. But the term in secular society always means buying back something that was yours and you've given away. Biblical redemption is simply the fact that Christ bought back our lives. He paid a price for our sin on the cross so that we might inherit eternal life again. Um, the book of Hosea that I just read from is a book about redemption and about God instructions for Hosea to uh, buy back his wife Bummer. He tells her, Hosea, early in the book to go marry this woman. They have children together, but then she leaves him and becomes a harlot. And Hosea is instructed in the passage we read this morning to go buy her back. And that's an example of God's dealing with Israel all through the Old Testament. It was a constant struggle God would do things with, for Israel, show them he was a loving and kind God, and they would turn to the gods of other people and habits and customs of other foreign lands and stray from the God Jehovah, the God of Israel, and he bought them back. And so this story of Hosea and Gomer that we read about in the book of Hosea illustrates that point. And that's why God's instructions to Hosea. It was recently, I think it was last fall, uh, one of the things that Nancy and I did before um, she became immobile was go to a movie called Redeeming Love. And actually the lead character, the lead male character in that movie was named Michael Hosea. So, uh, the story was obviously from what happened, uh, a remake of uh, God's dealing with the, in the book of Hosea, and it showed how this man had so much love for this woman who had been sold into prostitution, how he redeemed her back multiple times to save her from herself and what she had been sold into. Biblical redemption is Jesus buying us back. Uh, the illustration in the Old Testament also of Joseph being sold into slavery to the Egyptians. His brothers were jealous of him, threw him into a pit, left him for dead, but somebody rescued him, and we know the rest of the story. He wound up in Egypt in a high place and winds up in position to bail his brothers and his father out of trouble down the line but he was redeemed from the pit. Ruth in the Old Testament had nothing. She wound up marrying, uh, finding favor with Boaz and then marrying Boaz and he redeemed her 
from what she was experiencing and gave her a place to live and a place to stay. Uh, all sorts of stories in the Old Testament, but all this is a prelude of what Jesus has done for us. But apart from the law in Romans, the righteousness of God has been revealed and manifest, being witnessed by the law and prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, there's no distinction, Jew or Gentile, for all who sin and fall short of the glory of God, but being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Jesus Christ, who was publicly displayed as a propitiation for our sins. The difference, the chief difference in biblical redemption is we're not doing anything of ourselves. It's God's plan for us and his son being willing to come and be our savior and to be publicly displayed as a propitiation for our sins. And God did this for us. You go over a couple of chapters in Romans to Romans 5, and this explains in a, more, a little more depth or a detail what Jesus has done for us. While we were still hopeless, beginning in verse 6, while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man, someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having been justified by his blood, we have been saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. A couple other illustrations and comments about redemption in Galatians, the third chapter. Galatians 3.14, Galatians 3.13, excuse me. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs in a tree. In order that Jesus Christ, the blessing of Abraham, might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. And in chapter 4, Verse 5, 4 and 5. But when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And one more passage in Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians 1, 5 through 8. He pre predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood and forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. So we see in biblical terminology in Christian circles, redemption still means buying back. It's just that we can't pay the price ourselves or buy ourselves. Jesus commands his disciples at the Last Supper this do in remembrance of me. Every time we partake of the cup and the juice and think of the body and blood of Jesus, we are reminded of what he has done for us. We were unable to pay the price to do anything for ourselves, but God in his benevolence and in his mercy and in his plan of salvation bought us back through the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what we celebrate 
as we go to the communion table this morning. I'd like us uh, to do a, an exercise together. Uh, turn in your hymnals. And this is sort of the redeemed section. Uh, pages three, hymn number 379 through 382. Take a couple of minutes to look at these hymns, 379 through 382. Actually, two of them are the same words, just different tunes. Uh, I remember one of the tunes, 380 and 381. But as you read, say the first verse in the chorus to these hymns, outside of talking about the blood of Jesus, and what Jesus has accomplished for us, what else do you know in common to these hymns? Concept of mercy. Mm -hmm. What's our response Probably. to what Jesus has done for us? We're proclaiming it. Proclamation. We're proclaiming it. We're telling talking about it. If you if you fully understand, comprehend the depth of God's love for us. Christ, that Jesus Christ paid for our redemption, our natural reaction should be to proclaim that to all that we come in contact with, to our friends, to our loved ones, to our neighbors. We should always have the desire to proclaim the death and the reclaiming the redemption that we've received through Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. That's the best news in the world. Amen. And if you understand that, it should be our priority in life, our duty in life, to proclaim to all those we meet and all those we know that Jesus has redeemed us and we have eternal life through him. That's why the resurrection is important. That's why God's plan of salvation is so important to us. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, his child, and forever I am. Amen. Brother Jeremy and Brother Mark, would you come and help me communion? <clears throat> Reading Matthew's account of the last Passover. 
Matthew chapter 26. Now when evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve disciples. And as they were eating, he said, Truly I say to you that one of you will betray me. And being deeply grieved, they each one began to say to him, Surely not I, Lord. And Jesus answered, He who dipped his hand in with me in the bowl is the one who will betray me. And the Son of Man is to go just as it is written of him, but woe to the man whom the Son of Man has betrayed. It would have been good for him, that man, if he had not been born. And Judas, Judas who betrayed him, said, Surely it's not I, Rabbi. And Jesus said to him, You have said it. And while they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it with you anew in my Father's kingdom. And we all yearn for that possibility <coughs> and that time to come. Brother Mark, would you give thanks for the body of Christ? <clears throat> Lord, as we share this sacrament, we give time to stop and think that we do this to remind us of what you did for us. Amen. We do this every month so that we can remember that you loved us so much, even though we weren't worthy, mm -hmm. that you went to the cross for us. Oh, that kind of love is hard to find. And there's only one person who's ever been able to give it to us, and that was you. Lord, we thank you for the love that you pour upon us every day, even though we don't deserve it. We thank you for loving us so much that you would be willing to go to the cross to save us so that we will have everlasting life when you come again. Lord, thank you for the love that you pour upon us now and forever until you come again. In your name. Brother Jeremy, would you give thanks for the blood of the new covenant Christ blood shed for us? <clears throat> Father in heaven, sometimes we remember and sometimes we forget. Often we remember the things we shouldn't and we forget the things that we should. So I thank you that you choose to remember and choose to forget, but that you always get it right. You choose to forget our sins and remove them from us as far as the east is from the west. And you remember to keep every promise you've ever made. So Lord, the phrase for communion is often, uh, do this in remembrance. Lord, help us to, to get our remembering and our forgetting in line with your holy will. As Jesus gave to his disciples, I minister from him the fourth to you.
redeemed and so happy in Jesus. No language my rapture can tell. Eat thee the body of Christ. And you drink and partake of the blood of the new covenant. <clears throat> 